Hi guys, it's Mr. Pollock Biology here with another Unit 2 video. This time we're looking at haemoglobin and oxygen dissociation curves. So let's get started by looking at our objectives. Uh, you guys are going to understand the role of haemoglobins, you're going to understand how to interpret an oxygen dissociation curve, and you're going to explain the changes to oxygen dissociation curves that we can look at. So we should start off probably by talking about haemoglobin and what it is or what they are. And I say what they are because there are many, many, many different haemoglobins. Um, and they're all proteins that are found in red blood cells. So you have haemoglobins that are really, really strongly attracted to oxygen and some that are weaker att attracted to oxygen. But you need them for different situations. Um, the reason why haemoglobin is really, really interesting is because it exhibits many, many levels of protein structure. If you're a bit unfamiliar with protein structure or polypeptide structure, you should probably review my Unit 1 video. And you can click just above here to do that. So they exhibit primary, secondary and tertiary structures, which all proteins do. Um, and they also exhibit quaternary structure, which is where you get more than one polypeptide chain associated together. And haemoglobin has two alpha subchains and two beta subchains, all working as one big old molecule. Um, they also have these things called prosthetic groups, which are non-polypeptide chains incorporated into the structure of the, uh, the, the peptide itself. Um, and in this case, they are iron ion groups, so Fe2 plus groups. And haemoglobin has four of these, one per subchain. And this is what gives haemoglobin its oxygen carrying ability. And because of these uh, prosthetic groups, they bind, it's what makes haemoglobin bind reversibly with oxygen. Now, what do I mean by reversibly? Well, basically, we need to look at the role of haemoglobin and what it does in different situations, more specifically, different oxygen concentrations. So in high oxygen concentrations, such as, I don't know, the lungs, and low oxygen concentrations, such as the respiring tissues or muscles, haemoglobin is going to be in one of two different states. So where there's lots of oxygen, haemoglobin is going to be you know, loaded with O2, and it's going to be in the form of oxyhemoglobin. If it's in a low oxygen environment, oxyhemoglobin isn't going to be, well, oxygen and haemoglobin, they're not going to be together. It's going to be unbound. So the haemoglobin and oxygen will be separate. Um, and we talk about the transition between these two states um, as unloading, if we're moving this way, and loading, if we're moving this way. So oxyhemoglobin will unload at the tissues providing oxygen for respiration, essentially. Now, unloading can also be called dissociating, and loading can also be called associating. So really, it's just up to you which one you prefer. Pick one and stick with it. So how do we represent this more visually? Well, we can use an oxygen dissociation curve. And basically what this does is shows us how much of the haemoglobin we can find as oxyhemoglobin in different oxygen concentrations. So on the y-axis, we have the percentage saturation of haemoglobin, which is basically how much haemoglobin is oxyhemoglobin. And on the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of O2 measured in kilopascals. Now, partial pressure is basically just the concentration of a gas, so don't worry about that too much. And under normal conditions, haemoglobin's oxygen dissociation curve will look like this, a lovely sigmoid curve shape, an S-shaped curve. And what we see from this is that at high partial pressure of oxygen, haemoglobin is highly saturated with O2, and at low partial pressures of oxygen, haemoglobin is less saturated with O2. So if we put the parts of the body on this, well, for us, for humans, it's going to be lungs and muscles. There we go. The thing is, this curve doesn't always stay this shape. It changes slightly depending on um, a couple of different factors. So in low oxygen conditions, uh, or organisms that live in low oxygen conditions, they will have a slightly different O2 dissociation curve. So here's the normal one. And in a low O2 environment, the curve is shifted to the left. It's slightly different. So it looks like this. And the benefit of that is that haemoglobin is going to load more readily at a lower partial pressure of oxygen. So when you're talking about curves being shifted to the left, always talk about loading or associating, and it's at a lower partial pressure that this partial pressure that this occurs more readily. 
So if we draw some dotted lines on to show the maximum saturation point, we see that there's an absolutely huge difference just by a very small shift to the left. And this shift to the left is achieved by essentially producing different haemoglobins uh, that are, have a higher affinity for oxygen. And organisms that uh, exhibit these haemoglobins, they will typically be high altitude or underground or even a fetus. You know, a fetus needs to poach oxygen from the mother, which obviously is going to have, the mother is going to use up some oxygen from her bloodstream in respiration for her own cells. So the fetus needs to still be able to poach some of that oxygen um, for its own, its own needs. Usually AQA will give you an obscure animal to deal with um, and tell you that it lives either at high altitude or underground. My personal favourite is the llama, this beautiful beast here. Um, but they will also give you some horrible things like ragworms and lugworms and all sorts of grotty underground creatures. Don't be thrown off, just work out, is it in a low oxygen environment? If so, it's going to shift to the left. There is another curve that we need to worry about, or not worry about, but deal with, and that's um, this thing called bore shift. So in the case of bore shift, um, the curve is shifted to the right. And this is as a result of high levels of respiration or exercise. Okay, so this is bore shift. And the result of this is that haemoglobin is going to unload more readily at a higher partial pressure of oxygen. So in this case, haemoglobin actually has a less secure grip on the oxygen molecules and will start the unloading process earlier as we look from right to left, as we descend through partial pressures of oxygen. So the benefit of this is that it supplies tissues with more oxygen for aerobic respiration. But what causes this? Well, it's respiration. The more respiration you do, the more carbon dioxide you will produce. Carbon dioxide chemists amongst you will know, dissolves in water or dissolves in blood plasma, forming a weakly acidic solution. This weakly acidic solution is going to alter the tertiary structure of haemoglobin. Uh, effectively, it's starting to denature the protein, but not fully. And as a result of this change to the tertiary structure, the association between haemoglobin and oxygen is much weaker. So, before I summarise this, I want to show you a really cruel exam question um, from a couple of years ago. And here we have it. You get a bunch of oxygen dissociation curves from some different sized mammals. Elephants on the left through to mice on the right. The first part of the question simply says, say what you see. So a describe question is just say what you see. Um, and all you've got to do is say, the smaller the mammal, the further to the right the curve is shifted. Brilliant easy way to get a mark. However, the second part of the question is a bit more tricky. It says heat from respiration helps mammals to maintain a constant body temperature. Use this information to explain the relationship between the surface area to volume ratio of mammals and the oxygen dissociation curves of their haemoglobins. It's a heck of a mouthful. So first mark is going to be for basically saying that smaller mammals have a larger surface area to volume ratio. Um, second mark it's saying that they are going to lose heat much faster. Third mark is for saying that they're going to require more oxygen to maintain a high rate of respiration to get the heat. And the final mark is for saying um, about the actual curve itself. So a right shifted curve means haemoglobin will dissociate more readily at a higher partial pressure of oxygen. You could also say unload more readily. Same difference. And that's it. So, to summarise, haemoglobin binds reversibly with oxygen, and it's going to load in high oxygen conditions and unload in low oxygen conditions. A curve that's shifted to the left means haemoglobin loads more readily at a low partial pressure of O2, and a curve that's shifted to the right means that haemoglobin unloads more readily at a high partial pressure of O2. I hope that's been useful for you guys. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.